I'm New York Times Metro reporter Jeff May sitting in for Sam Roberts. This week, we take a look at the changing landscape of the American dream. A New York Times real estate reporter investigated the pressures first time home buyers now face as larger investors have moved in. But first, New York City's ongoing migrant crisis. The Biden administration has finally responded to New York Democrat calls for migrant work permits, and the housing battle has moved to Brooklyn. Mayor Adams' plan to shelter asylum seekers at Floyd Bennett Field has met resistance from local lawmakers. Fellow Times Metro Desk reporter Nicholas Fandos is following and filing the stories and joins us now. Welcome, Nick. Thanks for joining us. Always good to be with you, Jeff. So President Biden uh, extended uh, TPS status to Venezuelans. What did uh, Secretary Mayorkas give for uh, the reasons for that decision? Yeah, so this was a um, pretty surprising announcement Wednesday night, just as the president was leaving New York City, actually, where he'd been all week for the United Nations General Assembly and had been criticized for not saying anything about the migrant crisis. Um, it turns out his administration and the Homeland Security Department were preparing to extend this designation, and it's going to affect um, something like 470,000 Venezuelans who are already in this country and were here prior to July 31st. And what it means is that for the Homeland Security Secretary said that for the next 18 months, they will be protected from deportation and they will be allowed to seek legal work authorization um, much faster than they would if they were just um, seeking asylum uh, under the regular asylum policies. Um, this is done because uh, the department considers uh, Venezuela an unsafe place for them to return home to. Uh, and, and so this is a pretty big, um, pretty big action that will affect the situation here in New York City. And the Democrats have been pushing for, uh, you know, literally for months. Yeah, tell me about that. I know this, this wasn't necessarily expected. Mayor Adams did not meet with President Biden while he was in the city, but Governor Hochul did. Um, tell me a little bit about that lobbying effort, because Mayor Adams has been very critical of President Biden, right? Yeah, that's right. I mean, this has been a real outside inside game for months now. The mayor has been kind of the bullhorn, holding rallies, um, press conferences, really blasting the Biden administration for not doing more to help New York City um, in a variety of ways. And temporary protected status, as this is called, for Venezuelans was one of the big asks um, from Adams and other Democrats, because it will allow a large number of people who the city is caring for right now to go get jobs, make money, and get out of the shelters. So Adams was stating this very publicly in, in pretty drastic language and saying Biden you know, was leaving New York City basically um, to, to falter uh, and buckle under this. But the governor and members of Congress, including Senator Chuck Schumer and Representative Hakeem Jeffries, who are the top party leaders in the House and Senate, uh, for the Democrats, as you know, and both, both Brooklynites, were also working pretty aggressively behind the scenes to put pressure on the president. Basically, every immigrant advocacy group was calling for this as well on humanitarian grounds. Um, so there was quite a lot of pressure being exerted on the president by his own party. Um, some of it just for good governance reasons, some of it for humanitarian reasons, some of it for political reasons. Um, you know, Democrats are fearful if, if they don't uh, solve this problem and reduce the burden um, on places like New York City, this could really hurt them next year uh, at the polls. Yeah, talk about the burden on New York City. You know, Mayor Adams has made some projections on how this is affecting the city, both financially in terms of the city operation. What are we seeing in terms of the effects of the over 100,000 migrants who are here? Yeah, that's so the numbers are a little bit of a move, moving target. But, you know, as of right now, the city says that it has something like 60,000 migrants uh, in its shelter system. New York, uh, as you know, has a unique mandate to provide shelter to anybody who's homeless in the city. And that has been interpreted to include immigrants so far. Um, so uh, there are substantial numbers of migrant children who are in New York City public schools. The city is providing legal services and health care as well. The mayor says that all of this not only is, is becoming a space issue where to actually house and, and help accommodate these people, um, but a big financial issue as well. Um, again, the numbers are a little bit of a moving target here, but the mayor said this could cost the city up to $12 billion over the next several years. Um, the state's already allocated a billion and a half dollars, I think, just this fiscal year. The federal government has put up 
um, some money, though not nearly as much as leaders here want. Um, and, you know, the mayor is, is saying those costs are, may require budget cuts. Now, it's a little bit more complicated picture than he's letting on because of the city's underlying financial condition. But um, suffice it to say, Jeff, I mean, this is a this is a very expensive and complicated undertaking uh, that the city feels like, you know, it just can't shoulder on its own indefinitely. And the mayor made some controversial comments recently where he talked about how this crisis could potentially destroy New York City uh, as we know it. Um, what has been the response to that? Is, is that accurate? Do, do his fellow Democrats agree with those comments? Yeah, those comments were really, um, you know, pretty uh, uh, aggressive by the mayor and inspired a lot of different responses, particularly um, immigration advocates and kind of left-leaning Democrats were outraged by what he said and, and were saying that, you know, it was basically anti-immigrant, it was hyperbolic, that he was inflating the scope of the problem. Um, you know, privately more moderate Democrats think uh, this isn't so helpful. They point out Republicans are going around, you know, quoting the mayor left and right now to basically say, look, the Biden administration has created this huge problem that Democrats can't solve. If you talk to the mayor's advisors, they say what he's doing is strategic. He's trying to, you know, basically provoke his party to take this more seriously and get the attention of uh, you know the media and government actors outside of New York to get the help that New York City needs. Um, you know they're going to claim probably that TPS getting this designation is in fact the product of that kind of a pressure campaign and that it's working. Um, you know I think it's too early obviously to know the results of that strategy versus versus another. Um, Mayor Adams has said several times that he feels as if the city is not getting any help. I'm wondering if you think that's accurate. What has the Biden administration uh, and Governor Hochul done to help the city with this crisis? Um, I, you know, there's some truth to it, but it's it's obviously not completely accurate. Um, the, the state has helped with substantial resources. I mentioned the one and a half billion dollars um, that's been allocated so far. Um, the mayor has been working pretty closely with the governor uh, for his request from Washington, and you know the state is providing National Guard, um, you know, building intake centers for migrants itself, and, and putting the cost for others. That the city is operating, um, so the state has done uh, a, a fair amount, and the federal government so far, you know, is taking some of its own steps. It's allocated 140 million dollars to New York so far to help deal with this crisis. The Biden administration has asked Congress for more. Um, it has, uh, the Biden administration has sent folks onto the ground here in New York to try and help identify people who actually may already be work eligible, but don't realize it or haven't done the paperwork. They estimate there could be thousands of migrants here that if they could just work their way uh, through the paperwork in the system could actually be working right now, but the city has not helped. So there, there's been um, a range of steps like that and some more kind of bureaucratic efforts to try and speed up the processing of of, um, you know, different administrative things that have to happen to get people to work. I mean, one of the solutions that uh, Mayor Adams and Governor Hochul have come up with is the use of Floyd Bennett Field to house this sort of influx of migrants. Tell me a little bit about that plan. Do you know how many people uh, are going to be housed there? And this plan hasn't necessarily been received well, right? Yeah, so this is actually, this is another good example, the federal government's involvement. Floyd Bennett Field is is technically on federal land. It's a former airport, um, air, airfield. Now it's a um, parkland, federal parkland. So they've negotiated, the feds negotiated for months with the city and state to work out this contract, which was finalized last week. Um, the city and uh, the state's going to be footing a, a lot or most of the bill. Plans to build um, some temporary structures there to house at least at first, something like 2,000, potentially 2,000 migrants. Now, um, city officials have suggested at various points there might be the infrastructure to house several thousand more people there, though it's unclear if they're going to go down that road, in part because there's been a lot of political pushback um, on this site and on others uh, by Republicans, but also some local Democratic representatives um, who have raised various concerns from environmental concerns about that particular site. It's potentially flood prone, but also the impact that, you know, putting 2,000 people plus additional workers, um, housing them in that area will have on, you know, local emergency services, things like that. Now, 
Mayor Adams counters that um, this is actually one of the least intrusive places to, to put migrants in the city. It's, it's physically separated, um, you know, in, in Southeast Brooklyn on Jamaica Bay from a lot of neighborhoods. Um, but nevertheless, there's been pretty fierce opposition, which came to a head this week in a lawsuit um, from a dozen elected officials, including a Republican congresswoman and then four Democratic officials in the city um, suing to try and stop this site from opening. So and, we'll obviously be watching that play out in the courts. And one of those was, was uh, Nicole Maliotakis uh, as well. She's also introduced legislation related to this. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, that, that's right. So she's kind of taking, uh, you know, both approaches, trying in the courts, but also introduced bills that would prevent uh, basically the construction of migrant shelters on uh, military bases or other federal land. There's several sites in the city and her, her district on Staten Island and Brooklyn that, that she's targeting. I don't think those bills really have a chance of going anywhere. Um, you know, they're not going to, they may pass the Republican House as a kind of messaging exercise, but I don't see Senator Schumer being willing to take them up in the, in the Senate and, and or President Biden if you know, they were somehow to pass their signing them into law. Uh, a, but they are part of a, you know, a very concerted effort by Representative Maliotakis um, to, you know, try and oppose uh, the way the city is dealing with this crisis at, at almost every turn. Yeah, tell us big picture. We, we see the Republican congresswoman involved, Mayor Adams, President Biden. What, what, do you, what effect do you think this crisis is going to have on New York's political landscape as we look forward? Yeah, I mean, this is a it's a question that, um, you know, I've been writing, I think, could end up determining control of the House of Representatives because there are so many important swing districts here in New York. Um, I think it's a little early to say exactly what the political impact is going to be, but Democrats are certainly worried that uh, the number, the sheer number of people coming into New York City is just going to be too costly and difficult to deal with in the long term, and that the sense of, of kind of chaos and the inability of democratic uh, governance to deal with those problems is going to concern voters uh, who know, you know, Democrats really control things here in, in New York um, and are, could potentially punish their party. Republicans, uh, Republican candidates in all these key districts, we've already seen trying to kind of stoke this discord, a sense that Democrats through their policies at the border and adopting positions like being a sanctuary city, welcoming, opening their arms to migrants, um, basically invited these people to come here. And now they can't handle uh, caring for them. Um, and they would argue this shows Democrats, um, you know, unable to, to govern, you know, you ought to give our party a chance. Now we'll see if voters are convinced by that. Um, you know, I will say in the last couple of weeks, I think we've seen Democrats who were really at each other's wrote and, and infighting quite a bit, begin to get on the same page a little bit more um, and cool down some of those internal fights. Um, but there's a long way to go here. And this is a very dynamic, dynamic issue. Um, you know, the numbers of people crossing the border uh, have certainly not abated and, and uh, on, on some days and some months has, has only showed signs of increasing. Um, so I don't think, you know, even with this TPS designation and a facility of Floyd Bennett, I feel, you know, these are these are band-aids on a larger problem. Nick, thank you so much for your insightful reporting on this issue. Uh, we'll we'll talk again in the future, I'm sure, about this. Thanks, Jeff. Anytime. Coming up next, what happens when Wall Street wants in on rising home prices? Ever since soldiers returned in mass from the Second World War. The act of buying a home has been a path for many Americans seeking financial stability and eventually a comfortable retirement. But increasingly, this part of the American dream has become more and more out of reach as large investors muscle out first-time home buyers. New York Times real estate reporter Rhonda Kaysen visited one North Carolina neighborhood under siege to investigate. And she's here with us now to share the stories of its residents and how they are responding. Thanks for joining us, Rhonda. Thank you for having me. And so you did a lot of research. You were you focused yeah. in on one area, and you landed on a place called Bradfield Farms, right? Tell us right. about that. So um, basically, uh, Ella Cose, a uh, data reporter on the business desk, and I decided to look at a lot of housing data in the country. And we saw a trend that was happening in certain markets, particularly 
Sun Belt markets, markets where homes were actually more affordable. And so we, um, Charlotte was one of those markets. But then when we look closer into Charlotte, we saw this pattern where it wasn't that Charlotte, 17% of home purchases in 21 and 22 were to investors. But if you went into like the wealthiest, whitest neighborhood in South Charlotte with big lofty homes, you would never have encountered an investor. You would have encountered cash buyers, but they would have been individuals. But if you went into areas in North and East Charlotte, you could have upward of 80% of the cash purchasers were to investors. And those neighborhoods tended to have larger black and brown populations. They tended to have more affordable homes. So we found you know, one community that we saw as representative of this trend. And this one was called Bradfield Farms. It's about 35 years old. It has about 1,000 homes. Um, it has a large Latino and black population. Um, just a few years ago, you could have bought a three-family house with a nice yard for like $160,000, $150,000. Um, in 21 and 22, there was basically Wall Street back investors went on this feeding frenzy. They bought 50% of the homes in the community sold to them. On one block, every house that sold in a period of two years, except for one, sold to a Wall Street investor. And they turned all of those homes into single family rentals. Wow, so this is affecting black and Latino neighborhoods. What are some of the downsides to renting as opposed to being able to have access to a, a first time uh, home? Well, look, renting, you know, the single family rental companies and, and many of the rentals, renters will argue that this gives them an opportunity to rent a single family home. You don't have the responsibility of a mortgage. You don't have to come up with a down payment and you don't have to be in a multifamily home. You can have a yard, you can have a dog in the yard. So there's some benefits, but um, large investors tend to raise rents faster than smaller mom and pop investors. Um, the tenants I talked to said their rents went up substantially like 12, 15% year over year. They said the landlords were slow to make repairs. Um, there also is a larger issue, which is that a city like Charlotte is a city where people do ultimately want to own homes. And the way into ownership for many people is, is that first starter home or what used to be called a starter home. And if those homes are removed from the market, you lose access to that. And what you lose access to is generational wealth because yes, you may have to come up with a lot of money up front, but your mortgage stays steady for the life of the loan. And at the end of that, you have equity, even if you don't do anything to your house. And that is a major, is like most Americans' primary source of, source of wealth building. And it what sets you up for retirement. It sets you up for the end of your life. Um, you can pass it on to your heirs. And so you lose that. And that's a, and also um, black and Latino households are less likely to own homes than white households. So taking those homes has a larger impact. So this feels like a racial equity issue. It's reminiscent of the subprime mortgage crisis from you know, 2007, 2008, where we also saw a large number of black Latino homeowners affected uh, and losing their homes, right? Right, well, Wall Street got into the single family rental business in the wake of the 2008. So like 2008 happens, there's this mass foreclosure crisis and a lot of Wall Street firms see an opportunity to buy on the cheap and they buy up a lot of these foreclosed properties and they get into the single family rental market. So up until 2008, this was really like a small mom and pop thing. It wasn't like multifamily homes, which were larger, largely owned by corporations. So they started that, this process in 08 and now as the years went on, they have now moved into markets that weren't necessarily affected by subprime mortgage crisis. And uh, what I found interesting in your story was there appeared to be like some bias against renters, right? The homeowners in those communities were wary of renters coming in. Right, and I think the homeowners felt mixed feelings. You know, you would ask them and some of them say, look, I don't have a problem with the renters. I have a problem with the landlords, that the yards aren't maintained, that um, grass is overgrown, that there's siding isn't cleaned. Whether that's true or not, it's hard to prove is that a rental. But you dig deeper and there is some class resentment. I mean, so um, I was on a Facebook group for a while that was a F Bradfield Farms Facebook group and they're blaming renter, people are, um, homeowners are blaming renters for trash left on the curb, for furniture left on the curb, for feelings of rising crime, even though there actually was no evidence of crime rising. Um, a lot of homeowners I talked to described like teenagers running wild in the street. Well. Are those renters or are those owners? They don't really know. And uh, you know, when I looked at crime data for the community, crime had actually had gone down 
during that time, not up. So there's no actual proof that renters sort of decrease the value of there's properties. some there's some research that's been done that says that in communities where there's an increase of single family renters ho rentals home prices fall so there is some evidence of that um, whether they you know whether they don't maintain their properties or not there hasn't been as much research on that but um, to counter that researchers will say it actually provides more access to a community because it makes it more affordable it makes it more diverse it encourages more people to move into a community so there may be some benefit too. Did we see this trend um, increasing during the pandemic? How, how did the pandemic affect this process? Well, I think um, these companies got continued to buy. And what happened though, is that they may have been buying at the same level or in, you know increasing their purchases, but it was coming at a time where there was this frenzied American push for home ownership because interest rates were so low. So individual buyers were trying to buy because interest rates were at historic lows. And so, were the, so was Wall Street because they also were taking advantage of those low interest rates. And so everybody's competing for these same homes. And so if you're in this frenzied market and you're out competed by all cash, um, these companies would call homeowners, they would text them, call them, email them, offer to buy their homes in cash, sight unseen, no, no inspection. They didn't even have to stage the house. And so as an individual, how can you possibly compete with that? So that is, I think, why homeowners were, or buyers were particularly aware of it during the pandemic, because they just couldn't compete and couldn't break in. Now, you crunched the numbers to find this specific neighborhood. I'm wondering, are investors doing the same thing? Are they using artificial intelligence or other means to find the areas that would work for this strategy? Um, I would imagine they are. I think if you look at the way that they're shopping around the whole country, there's a surgical precision to it. They're not just buying anything anywhere. They're really targeting specific neighborhoods. And I'm sure they have the computer programs that can do it. I mean, my reporting, I, you know, we didn't go into that, but um, it's a pattern and it's a pattern that's repeated in Las Vegas, in Atlanta, in Phoenix, in Tampa. And you can just see it over and over in these city after city. Um, and, you know, single family rental organizations will say, look, you know, large corporate, com a large corporations only own 3.8% of all the single family rentals. But that's not exactly true because that's a nationwide number. But in Charlotte, it's 20%. In Atlanta, it's 28%. So they've targeted these, these cities and markets where home prices are more affordable. And you see, this is happening across the country, right? right? What about in sort of major metro areas like New York City, for example? They've been less active and because home prices are really high. So it's, uh, there's, there's less profit to be made. Um, however, um, my colleagues at times have reported on private equity buying multifamily homes in New York City. And so that's a newer trend to watch and is, is just getting started. And so, you know, it remains to be seen what will come of that. I mean, it feels like there's a baked in sort of racial element here, because if they are not focusing on higher priced homes, which are mainly owned by uh, non-black, non-black Latino people, but they are focusing on homes that are, you know, mid-priced homes that are owned by blacks and Latinos, that seems like there's this sort of baked in racial element there. Certainly. Yeah. I mean, I think, I, I mean, it may not be the intent, but it's the effect. And um, it makes it even harder for black and Latino families to break into ownership when they already have a lot going against them to get there. Uh, how do you think this is going to affect uh, generationally? We already know, uh, you know, millennials and others are feel like they are priced out of the market. How is this going to affect people who eventually want to own homes? And subsequently, how will it affect people who are retiring and maybe want to sell their homes? Well, I think um, if we start with the people who are retiring and want to sell, you know, it's it's not so bad because it's another market to sell. But I think that, um, you know, home prices have gone up 40% in like went up 40% between 2020 and 2022, which is the highest increase in U.S. history. So um, it's really hard to buy a home. And right now it's incredibly hard because interest rates are the highest they've been in 21 years. So, and prices haven't come down. In fact, in Charlotte, they went up. Um, in a lot of markets, they've continued to go up. So I think it's just another barrier to breaking into ownership. And it's another, um, it's another piece of a puzzle of, a, of, of wealth building that a lot of families are missing out on. And home prices went up, but rents went up a lot too. Rents went up by double digit percent increases too during that time. So if you're renting, you, an argument can be made, well, you don't have to come up with a down payment, you don't have to pay for maintenance, but you're paying far more in rent than you would have been paying a couple of years ago, which makes it even harder to save for a down payment to buy a home. 
you you write the ask the real estate uh, I I did well. for ten years. I have okay. not anymore. So, but, uh, but you but you had a chance over that period to talk to a lot of homeowners, yes. renters. I'm wondering if is there any effect on the fact that uh, the homes are becoming uh, seemingly much more of a financial instrument of of Wall Street. Uh, there has always been this sort of push of the American dream, owning your home, right. passing on generational wealth. I mean, is there a mood change among uh, buyers and? Well, I think I mean I've talked to. A lot of younger buyers um, and for a lot of feature stories and for ask real estate and I think there's there's a sadness and there's a frustration of feeling locked out and feeling that these are like milestones in life um, and maybe you grew up in a home that was owned and you may be facing a feeling that you won't be able to afford a home and, and trying to break into markets where you know in San Francisco the medium home price I'm sorry in Los Angeles the medium home price is, is over a million dollars and so that, that's a that's a lot of money. I mean, I, I mean to come up with a twenty percent down payment for a million dollar house. I mean, that's just um, that's just bonkers. And so I think that um, you know I think people you know and also a lot of people lost a lot of wealth in 08. So people who are maybe in their late thirties, you know, you have older millennials. Some I spoke with said they're still digging out from that. Um, and so I think some people feel like it's a, an ever elusive dream to kind of crack ownership. We saw what happened with the subprime mortgage crisis where uh, lenders had to be bailed out by the federal government. What happens in this case, you know, as, as these rental properties become more purchased and, and then they fail or investors lose interest? Right. Well, investors and analysts will say there's nothing to worry about. Um, however, um, you know, lenders for mortgages, we'll look at, a, look at a neighborhood or look at a, a building where there's too many investor-owned proper, properties and they won't, they're reluctant to lend because they see it as high risk. So, I mean, you know, it, it, it's a risk. If, um, you know, if a series of Wall Street investors own 30% 30, 30 of all the homes in Bradfield Farms, or at this point, maybe they own around 23%, it's a little hard to quite pin it down. Um, if they, if they pull out relatively quickly of that community or and then multiple communities and you put that throughout Charlotte, you could see a problem that arises. Um, but right now, you know, the argument is these companies have big pockets. They have huge Wall Street dollars. They've got, you know, um, among their investors is, you know, Vanguard and our pension funds and um, you know, so they'll say, well, they're very stable and they're not going anywhere. But as we know from 08, stability is questionable. Wow. Rhonda, thanks so much for joining us and talking about this important issue. Thank you for having me. That's it for today's show. I'm Jeff Mays filling in for Sam Roberts. Join us again next week on CUNY TV.